Welcome to Oh God, What Now? I'm Ros Taylor. On today's show, why is Jeremy Hunt cutting tax when public services are in the toilet? We'll talk about the bits of the autumn statement that have gone under the radar. We'll also be trying to get to the bottom of why Britons hate inheritance tax so much, even when most of us don't pay it. And in the extra bit for Patreon backers, we're each giving you a couple of reasons to be cheerful, so stick around through the death and taxes for that. By the way, a little little bit of news. We answer a question from a Patreon backer every week in our But Your Emails section, but we know that people sometimes get frustrated that they ask questions that don't get answered. So we're doing a But Your Emails special on Wednesday the 6th of December, where we'll be answering a lot of them. Patreon people, there's a post on the Patreon page asking you for your questions, and we'll remind you nearer the time. So get your inquisitorial hat on. Now let's meet the panel. First up, it's commentator and actor Alex Andreu. Hi, Alex. Hello, Rose. You're still keeping an eye on the COVID inquiry and you did a bunker this week on what we've heard so far. What have we found out? Uh, the things were even worse than we imagined, if that if that is possible. Uh, Patrick Vallance, especially on Monday, was absolutely scathing of the, the indecision, the dithering the, that went on. I mean, many things are very important in terms of learning lessons, taking things forward. And I think I will be doing more updates with Professor Christina Pargill, judging from the big response we got. But in political terms, I think the most important um, issue brewing is probably the revelations over the eat out to help out scheme. And that is because the progenitor of that scheme, one Rishi Sunak, is now a PM. So if witness reports pan out that he was quite relaxed about a lot of people dying to reopen the economy, if they prove to be true, the reputational damage could be absolutely huge on him. And I think I am absolutely certain this is something he will be asked when he gives evidence in the next few weeks. Also joining us is comedian Matt Green. Hi, Matt. Hello. London will not now be getting a Las Vegas-style megasphere. I don't know how I feel about this, frankly. What What is a megasphere? Should we have one? I don't know. I mean, I am personally <laughs> devastated we're not getting a mega sphere because presumably that means we also won't get a mega cube, a mega, <laughs> mega pyramid, um, any kind of mega massive shape. At all. Mega structure. Exactly. Mega rhombus. But, yeah, but what, mega makes parallelogram. It, what makes it so mega? Well, I mean, the thing is, I do think it does look amazing. I've seen pictures of the Vegas sphere. Um, it's this massive sphere covered in millions and millions of LEDs on the inside and outside. And if you watch even just a tiny bit of it, I found just watching a tiny bit of it on my phone made me feel really dizzy and vertiginous. So the idea of actually being in there, um, I think it must be like going to the IMAX cinema, like, which I went to quite a lot as a kid. And, you know, you sort of feel like you could sort of fall into the screen. It's so so massive and overwhelming. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think it looks amazing in Las Vegas. It really fits into the kind of craziness of the strip. But sort of in a bit of East London next to residential area, probably less so. Yeah, there were people who were kind of worried that they would it would just shine all all night and yeah, it sort keep of it does. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I, I mean, I think in Vegas it does, and, and I just seen an article just now by the the guy who uh, from MTG, I think it is, the company who wanted to set it up, and he's now saying, "No, that's it. We're going. We're taking our sphere. We're going to take it somewhere else. You can't have our sphere." Um, and uh, and he said, "We would have turned it off at night and things like that." And you think, "Yeah, but would you though? And how late would it have gone? Because I think you know maybe they'd have turned it off at one in the morning or something, and then that would really still have messed up a lot of people." People's sleep patterns. Yeah, they wouldn't have done. Before long, you'd have had advertising on it at all times of the day in every combination. It would be like Piccadilly Circus, but like mega Piccadilly Circus. And maybe a phone number to call if the guy responsible for <laughs> yeah. turning the sphere off forgot. So you're calling at half two in the morning going, Ed, can you turn off the fucking sphere? <laughs> Well, as someone who gets dizzy on a bus, this sounds, you know, absolutely hideous. <laughs> Thank God this megasphere is not coming to London. Our guest this week is Chief Executive at the New Economics Foundation, the Labour parliamentary candidate for Camberwell and Peckham at the next election, and former star of the show, Miata Van Buller. Hi, Miata. Welcome back. Hi, thanks for having me back. Now, before we get on to the biggest show in town, the Autumn Statement, you've been looking at NEF, at the government's childcare plans, and you found there's a serious problem with them. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so if you cast your minds back um, to uh, the last uh, intervention by the Chancellor, he essentially massively expanded the childcare offer um, and in effect turned childcare into another public service. So good news all round. But the worry for many people was that actually without reforms to the way childcare is delivered and critically without enough investment to the childcare system, he was storing up lots of problems. So the analysis that we've done shows that firstly, what we're finding is that low-income families in particular have really poor access to childcare. And then because of the way that the funding flows, areas that we see greater levels of deprivation where we see many more poor households are what we called childcare provision deserts. So there are basically three or more kids for every place available. And if you are talking about childcare as a public service, that's a massive problem. So it suggests to us that the government is storing up some big problems in terms of funding, in terms of the delivery, the design of the childcare system, which, by the way, so many people are reliant, reliant on, absolutely critical for women to get into the work and are storing up lots and lots of problems for a future government. So it's like building hospitals, but only in rich areas. That's basically it. <laughs> Deck the hall with tat from our shop. Fa la 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 la. Before we start, a quick reminder that a Christmas market is now open with a 10% Black Friday discount on everything. This year, we've got brand new designs on mugs and t shirts from Oh God What Now and some of our companion podcasts like Paper Cuts and This Is Not a Drill, all available at podmarket.co.uk. Liven up breakfast time at Christmas with our new luxury belief mugs and t shirts or the remaining old guard can really rub in the hindsight with new hate to say I told you so t-shirts with the old Romaniacs logo. Just visit podmarket.co.uk for 10% off the Christmas presents the whole family wants. That's podmarket.co.uk. How things change. A month ago, the Chancellor said tax cuts were unaffordable. Now, national insurance has been cut to 10%. Miata, what changed? So... <laughs> In essence, inflation has done it. So <laughs> the amount of money that the government is getting in tax receipts has gone up because of inflation. And relative to the rules that the government sets about how it's going to borrow, how it's going to spend, the Chancellor basically has a bit of headroom, a little bit more money to spend. Um, and he is choosing to give a whole lot of that away. The most important thing I can say is within that headroom, there is the assumption that there were already going to be some pretty eye-watering cuts to public services, so to the tune of about 20 billion. And he has chosen to continue with those cuts to public services. So that's our schools, where, by the way, the roofs are crumbling on our kids, our hospital, our NHS that is on its knees, child, uh, child care, social care, local services. He has chosen to bake in cuts in real terms for the next few years, in order to use that headroom for what seems to be uh, pre-election giveaways. Yeah, this is what I find so hard to grasp. I mean, the NHS waiting list is supposed to have been one of Rishi Sunak's five priorities. And you'd think a bit, a little bit of fiscal headroom could have been channeled into that, but we got the national insurance cut instead. Is this, do you fear, partly to make life more difficult for Labour if, if you win next year? I think so, yes. I mean, I think that it, it's a really bizarre um, autumn statement because, yes, there were tax cuts in terms of national insurance, but all the number crunchers have very quickly spotted that actually these are more than up offset by the freezing of the tax threshold. So for the person on the street, you actually don't feel that much better off. You will not feel the benefit of it. But what you will see is your schools crumbling. What you will see is the NHS on its knees. You will see the impacts of cut to public services. And there was a really interesting poll that came out that showed that actually three out of four people would prefer the government to invest in public services that they can see are on their last legs rather than tax cuts. So yeah, they got to have the thing that they're going to have on their pledge card, a tax cut. But actually, when people aren't feeling the benefits of that, but more importantly, they're very worried about the crumbling state of our public realm. I'm not sure it's a smart political calculation. Jeremy Hunt talked about resource spending, and that sounded to me, it rang kind of euphemism alarm bells. It's only going up by 1%. What does resource spending actually mean? Yeah, well, you're, you're right to spot this. So resource spending is day-to-day -day spending. 
so the spending that we put into our police force, uh, into paying for our teachers, into paying for our nurses, our doctors, it's everyday spending. It's different to cattle spend, which tends to be investment in infrastructure, investment in building, investment in kit. And the fact that it's only rising by 1% suggests that we are looking at real terms cuts to public spending. So this goes back to my point that he said very little about how he was going to resuscitate our public services. And the idea that after, you know, near on 13 years of cuts where everyone can see how absolutely fractured and broken our public services are, services are that they could be baking in further cuts, I think is really worrying. And what it does is it stores up problems for the next government. Businesses got a carrot as well. Um, for those of us who don't run a business, Alex, what is full expensing and why is Jeremy Hunt calling it a tax cut? It sounds slightly dirty when you say it. Um, it, it I mean, effectively, it's uh, a writing off uh, investment, either in sort of things or um, research or future growth or whatever, uh, writing it off, how much of it you're you're allowed to write off on your accounts and when you're allowed to write it. So the new rules means that you can write off much more of it, like in the year that you spend it. Um, and, and so that is, I mean, that has been broadly very welcomed um, by business. It is a, a good measure. I'll tell you something really quite funny. Um, so uh, Rachel Reeves, called for this only about a month ago. Um, and uh, the Treasury put out a statement that reads as follows. Rachel Reeves said Labour would extend full expensing. She would also make full expensive 100% tax relief on capital investment permanent. Labour will always take the easy way out, not the difficult long-term decisions. I mean, labour sums just don't add up, torpedoing the fiscal rules. This was nine <laughs> days ago. This was nine days ago. Laura Trott, the new Treasury Secretary, put this out nine days. I mean, they must have known they were doing it by that point. Either this was a completely last minute thing that they threw in and they didn't know, or the right hand is not communicating with the left. I mean, I don't even I don't even know what to say on that. It's it's basically in the general category, it's okay when we do. It's responsible when we do it. It, and then, they, and then they have the goal of calling her the cut and paste. I know shadow chancellor. I mean, yeah. it's, it, it, I, I just this made me just cackle because I remembered them putting out this really aggressive thing, and to to now see it in their um, mm. autumn statement is just hilarious. I mean, it tells you everything you need to know. Yes, sir, tax levels are at their highest since records began 70 years ago. And this budget isn't, uh, sorry, this autumn statement, I keep thinking it's a budget because it's just like a budget, even though it's an autumn <laughs> statement. Uh, it isn't going to change that. People want better public services, as you say, but they also say that they don't want to pay even more taxes. How is Labour going to try to square this circle? And I know this is probably the biggest and most difficult question mm -hmm. I could ask you and probably one of the diff most difficult to answer as well. Look, I think it's tough, but, you know, for me, you know, my sense is that people will suck up paying taxes if they can see the benefits of it. The thing that is galling for people is, A, when they see huge amounts of waste. So Best of Britain, for example, did some analysis that showed that 100 billion of taxpayers' money has basically been squandered and wasted by the government. That irritates people because their hard-earned income seems to not be used well or smart. But I think the second thing is taxes have been going up, but public services have been declining. And people can't square that. Mm. You know, so if you're putting in more money, but you're not getting better schools, you're not getting a better NHS, you're not getting better policing, that is a problem. And so for me, the way you square the circle is you get the system to start working a bit better. You know, you try and reform, you try and improve our core services, because I think if people have world class services, you know, no one wants to pay tax, but you'll be like, actually, I'm getting something out of it. It means I don't have to go private in order to see a GP. It means I don't have to make make sacrifices because those core foundational services are there. So, you know, I would flip the question on its head because I actually think it's the failure to do the basic job of government and provide foundational services that is the thing that is galling for people. And if you deliver that, there's a deal in exchange. You know, that polling that said that three in four people are happy to pay more tax, 
but they have to get something in return. And I think that is the thing that the government's got wrong. Alex, along with the tax cuts for working people came the threat of benefit cuts for people who can't or aren't working. What's new there? Um, so as uh, uh, as I predicted last week, they, they've been making some noise about setting a time limit for uh, people deemed unable to work to basically either find work or do work that the state tells them to do or lose their benefits. Um, I mean, and I was listening to uh, Torsten Bell analyze this stuff as I was coming into the studio. And actually, the number we're talking about is in the low thousands. So this is a completely just symbolic kicking they're they're giving people just to posture that they're tough on this kind of stuff. There's very little detail with it. But what you find in the small print of the budget, actually, is that they are shifting hundreds of thousands of people between bands of benefits. So they're now saying that people with minor mental health issues, which they seem to define as anyone who hasn't been sectioned, or minor mobility issues will now move to the lower band of um, benefits, which makes a difference of about £4,000 a year for about 300,000 people. So the, actually, the big measure, the big nasty is buried in the small print. Um, but it, I would like to tie this to what we were talking about right at the top of the show, because this is, you know, Prime Minister who has Chancellor ignored warnings about long COVID, which is what is putting a lot of people out of work at the moment. It, it, it estimates uh, say there's over a million people with long COVID symptoms in the UK at the moment, and many of them are finding it difficult to work. So he ignored warnings about long COVID, encouraged people to go out there and, and infect each other four months before a viable vaccine was found. Um, and now he's giving them a sort of extra kicking by saying, oh, by the way, you know, brain fog, brain schmog, go out and, go out and work in a call centre. And I just think it's a, a sort of perfect distillation of the nastiness of this lot. Yeah, brain fog is an incredibly dis debilitating symptom. Yeah. And, you know, having suffered from it myself, it's just it's hard to explain just how you can't yeah. actually overcome yeah. it easily. The new Treasury Minister, Laura Trott, said disabled people must do their duty by working from home. This is quite a narrow view of disability, isn't it? That the expectation that you can work from home if you are disabled. It's quite a narrow view of life, to be honest, <laughs> that you have a duty to work. And I, I, I struggle again as with, for instance, removing a cap from bankers' bonuses while threatening disabled people with cuts. There is this magical point at which the rules change, you know, at which people are motivated by uh, bonuses rather than threats. And, and we see quite a similar thing here, right? Because presumably Laura Trott doesn't mean that the rich donors to the uh, uh, Tory party have a duty to go out and work or that, you know, retirees who um, manage to retire early and play golf have a duty to go out and work or the, the wives of rich people have a duty to go out and work. Presumably, she just means, you know, disabled people. So again, we see a really different ethic almost that applies to the most vulnerable than does to the the best off. And that's quite difficult to square for me. It feels to me that also they're using working from home just completely differently depending on what the argument is. Because there's this now that they're using it as like, well, lots of people can work from home now, so we can get people to work from home. But at the same time, there are lots of people saying, lots of people in government saying, we don't want people working from yeah. home. You should go yeah, back yeah, to yeah. the yeah, office. You and then you, then you have transport people saying, well, no, we don't need more trains because everyone's working from home. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, what do you want? You, you're not clear at all about what you, and they just use it depending on the argument. They just switch their, their opinion. And, and that, I think, is actually a theme of the budget. It lacks for me a narrative. I don't understand what the government is actually trying to do here. I don't, I mean, 
I understand what they're trying to do politically. They're trying to just give a few bungs and then have the, their MPs bang on the desks and, and the newspapers that we know will hail this as a, as a Thatcherite miracle tomorrow will come and dutifully do that in exactly the same way they did when Truss and Kwarteng did their budget last year. But I don't understand the overall uh, economic aim of the budget. Last night on Newsnight, you had three quite prominent economists. You had Mariana Matsukato, Mohamed El Elerian, and Shakram Singham. And they are from very different wings of economics, right? One is a very progressive economist, one is a sort of orthodox center um, economist, and the other one is a really free marketeer. And all of them, all of them agreed that the focus of this budget was wrong, that not to address growth, that not to address the gap in productivity is just madness at this point to just give small tax cuts to people who have very little multiplier effect, who do nothing for the future, um, and you see that in the OBR growth forecasts, right, which have been downgraded because in part they have looked at what the government is planning to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is not just something that happens like whether the OBR looked at the budget, they saw there's nothing in there for growth and, and went, so growth is going to be much lower in the next three years than we anticipated. Well, Hun did say he was announcing 110 measures to help grow the British economy and uh, we, we, I'll ask Miata about those in a, in, in a minute. <laughs> oh, it must too. be good if it's 110 <laughs> of them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to go through them all, don't worry. Um, Miata, the triple lock has stayed, so pensioners will get 8.5% more each year. Is that fair when universal credit has only gone up by 6.7%, which might sound generous, but in the context of inflation, it really isn't, is it? it? It's not fair, but I think it's consistent because what we've seen with this government is a sustained assault on people on social security, um, whereby social security is now one of the lowest in advanced economies and certainly at the lowest point in our post-war history. And, you know, for me, there is a basic principle that our safety net should ensure that people can afford the essentials in order to live so they're not having to rely on food banks. You know, food bank usage has gone up by 25 times uh, since 2010. So there was a genuine problem. And time and time again, what we see the government do is not have a proper plan to either support those that can't work, because there are people with disability and long-term illness that can't work. There are many that want to work, and actually they could be doing more to support them into work. And by the way, dealing with our NHS, which again would help with um, people on long-term um, sickness, and yet it's just an assault on vulnerable people. Um, now, it could have been much worse. Many of us were really worried that they would do a little bit of a sleight of hand and not uprate benefits with the traditional inflation measure in September. They didn't do that, which is good news. But we are scraping the barrel. Um, when you think about the level of hardship out there, uh, the fact that the government has just written off I think that segment um, of uh, our community, possibly because they decide that they don't vote for them, I think is just a disgrace. Alex, the OBR go growth forecasts are really low, 0.7% next year. Why have they been cut from the levels they were at earlier this well, because, year? Because, like I said, there's nothing targeted at growth. And this is really the, the, the central disappointment in this Budget. There's a total lack of ambition. There's a, a lack of scale and scope to meet the challenges of the scale and scope that we're that we're facing. Right, and like I said, we know they're going to get three to four percent boost out of this because everyone is going to go. Oh, aren't they fantastic? They, you know, they gave you two p off national insurance. But actually, you know, the IFS looked at the national insurance cut today, and they found that it's a tiny uh, increase for average earners. Uh, it's just about offset by the fact that, you know, the, the bands have been frozen. So because there's loads of inflation, more people are pushed into the higher band. And then it's a, it's a net loss for low earners and high earners. And so there is real things coming up. There is Christmas coming up, yeah? There's a Christmas shop coming up. 
That is when people do it, they get the same stuff every year. That is when people will notice how much prices have go, uh, gone up. That is when people will notice that their, you know, their salary runs out even earlier every month. And there is a danger, I have said this before, there is a, a, a massive political peril in the rhetoric running too much ahead of what how people actually feel. Because if you get Sunak and, and Hunt standing there being really quite smug and going, oh, our plan is working and we're wonderful, but people don't see it in their pocket, that backfires. That becomes a, a, a risk. And I think they will basically gain a few points and then lose them by the end of January. That's, that's my prediction. Well, I wanted to ask you about that Miata running ahead of things, because Jeremy Hunt seems to think we've got on top of inflation. But I'm not feeling it, to be honest, and I don't think a lot of other people are either. Is it really going to continue to fall? Well, so, I mean, the OBR, so that's the government's economic watchdog, is now predicting that inflation will be higher for a longer period of time. Um, and for me, you know, if we talk about these terms, but it's what people feel on the ground. And yes, he has halved inflation, although actually he hasn't. It's a whole load of factors that have nothing yeah, yeah. to do with the government. <laughs> but, but critically, when for most people, energy bills are 49% higher than they were two years ago. Food bills are about 28% higher than they were two years ago. And prices are still rising it doesn't feel like anything to celebrate about. And I think the biggest risk for the government is that it looks, you know, like it is celebrating this bizarre measure when people just don't feel it in their lives. Um, and the, 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 the big message, so for me, you know, all the like noise of the, uh, the budget and uh, the Office of Budget Responsibilities Assessment, I always go to their assessment of living standards because in the end, that's what matters. You know, yeah. how does this feel for people? What's improving their lives? And, you know, the OBR's assessment was that we're seeing the largest reductions in people's living standards since records began in 1950. Like, that's all you yeah. need to know about how well the government is doing. So for me, it's a complete failure. Like, that's the number one thing a government must be trying to do, improve people's living standards, because <laughs> otherwise, what, what is it all about? And on that one basic measure, catastrophic failure. And so, Mieta, it goes back to what you were talking about. We're seeing the largest tax burden since 1948, right? We are seeing the the most crumbling public services we have seen in generations. We have see we are seeing the biggest drop in living standards. And so, at some point, people begin to ask, "Where where is my money going?" Right, because taxes are still going up. There was a cab driver calling in. Um, Radio 5 Live as I was coming in. And he was saying, what do I care about 2P or national insurance if I end up having to take out private health insurance? You know, how much is that going to set me back every year? And that's what people are feeling right now. You know, they're feeling that that everything's crumbling around them. So they have to start looking at private schools for their kids and private health insurance for their health. And, you know, Jeremy Hunt stands up and, and sort of smiles and gives them back 2p on a national insurance that actually will be wiped out because they'll, they'll be moved onto the higher band. And it's, it's, it's just not working anymore. You know, an election is a, is a, an election is a sort of general IQ test. And I think there's enough information out there for us to pass it. These 110 measures, just going back to them briefly, Miata, uh, we won't in, and we, we can't go through them all. And I, I don't know if you've had a chance <laughs> to go through them all in the kind of detail that I expect you would like to. But were there any which you think could work, to be fair to Jeremy Hunt? Is there, is there some positive stuff in the mix? Um, I'm going to try and be my most uh, positive I can I can muster. Um, I think it was Chris Giles that says, when you've got 100 measures for growth, it means you don't have a single measure for growth. And I think that sums it up. <laughs> but if I had to, if I had to pick uh, two. So look, th there was a line that was thrown away around housing um, and doing more to boost housing. And we actually know that uh, the, the impacts of housing in terms of jobs that you create, in terms of the impact on the um, economy, as well as the fact that you're actually delivering homes that people desperately need is a good thing uh, for growth in the economy. And then there was a splattering of things around levelling up, um, things, investment zones in places, devolution deals, all aimed at trying to improve the productivity and drive growth in places. So there were some nuggets in there. 
but it was so far from a coherent plan. I mean, it's quite shocking. It generally feels that like they are out of ideas and out of steam and out of road because, you know, when, when the OBR are giving you those sorts of projections, you'd imagine the year before an election where you're worried about your legacy, where you're trying to, you know, against the polls, close the polls, that you'd be pulling out all the stops. And the fact that, yes, there were 110 tiny little things, but there were no game-changing measures just suggests they are out of ideas. And it happens to governments at the end of their road, but it definitely feels like it is the end of the road. Matt, you're self-employed, as am I at the moment. How are you feeling about that daring abolition of Class 2 national insurance contributions? I think the problem with um, me and national insurance is I don't understand it at all anyway. And every time, I've never understood <laughs> what Class 2 means. And today's the first time I've actually looked it up and gone, oh, that's the difference between Class 2 and Class 4. Now it will not be relevant, apparently. I, I just sort of think it's going to mean that for the next few years, I'm going to assume I've missed something on my tax return because it will be like Class 1, Class 3, Class 4. <laughs> And then I'll be like, where, hang on, where did, what happened to class two? <laughs> and they won't move them all up, but they'll just leave them. Um, and I don't know, I mean, it, yeah, it, it, it's from the point of view of it's a bit of extra money, I guess. It's not a huge amount of money um, and it's not, it is a specific amount, isn't it? It's not a percentage, so it's it's a small amount over the course of a year. Um, and there is always a part of you, I think, as a self-employed person that slightly resents the, the national insurance aspect of paying tax because you don't get a lot of the things that it is hypothetically meant to pay for. Um, you don't get sick pay, holiday pay, all these sorts of things. Um, although I suspect the the full expensing thing, that might help self-employed people as well if they're people who have... Um, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of things I can invest in. <laughs> um, uh, maybe I'll have to buy some new equipment. Um, uh, yeah, a new know, laptop. New might laptop. Come into I it. mean, yeah, I've definitely put a couple of those through uh, taxes over the years. Um, and yes, yeah, so maybe I'll get some more camera equipment and lighting and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there are there are things about it which I thought yeah, that was all right, but not a hu- it didn't have a huge impact because I don't think it's going to be a huge amount of money. There were some jokes in the statement. There are always some jokes. <laughs> How do you rate Hunt's comedy? Oh God, it was I, it was so boring. <laughs> oh, it's so yeah, hard. Just pissing to, <laughs> it was really hard to listen to because, um, like, he started with the lamest David Brenty joke. You know, the kind of I come with good news. <laughs> it's my wife's birthday. It's all oh, for goodness' sake. <laughs> he was all about Barbie at one point. I could really work out why. I, just, I mean, I, I have to say, I probably filtered some of his so-called jokes out because they just didn't hit at all as jokes. Um, I just all I hope is that his wife got an actual present as well as that <laughs> awful cringy moment. There was a lot of I mean I mentioned it already. There's a lot of kind of referencing. I think they did it three or four times trying to they're trying to get this idea of Rachel Reeves as the copy and paste um, shadow chancellor because of the plagiarism thing from her book, but. That feels very weak to me. I just don't think it's Especially good. when they keep nicking her policies. Well, exactly. <laughs> and, and the thing is, I just think the plagiarism thing is such a sort of odd, sort of strange, obscure thing that most people won't have heard of. And then they're trying to... They, it's like they're trying to make a reference back to a joke that no one's understood <laughs> in the first place. And I know as a comedian, that is easy to do. And it's it doesn't work ever. If you try and make a joke about something people don't understand, it's just going to be a, a, a sort of damp squib. And then there was that awful Jeremy joke where he did a thing about, you know, both of us wanted to a uh, Jeremy to be Prime Minister, but luckily for for me, uh, my party didn't want me to be. And and I just think it was I was listening to going, hang on, that's a really quite it's quite a telling joke there that you're saying my party definitely doesn't want me to be Prime Minister. And yet you are the Chancellor. That is the second most important job in government. And you've kind of made it clear that you definitely shouldn't have been Prime Minister. And then he made some crack about um, their Jeremy Corbyn would have crashed the economy, whereas our Jeremy is, is me. And and it's like, hang on, what about the mini budget? That happened just over a year ago. That I mean, crashed the that, economy. That never happened. Way. Never happened. That it's been we just like, like it's been but completely... they put out a big media line that was like, you know, we found out last September what happens when prices yeah. are uncosted and Labour will do that. And it's like, really, is that your is that your attack line that Labour might be as bad? As the last prime minister, we yeah. foisted on. If you. you don't watch out, they possibly might have might done be something. Might like Liz Truss. They might have done something. We actually did. So, <laughs> so it's, it's like those those memes that go round where they, they'll have a 
a photo of something horrible that's happening in the world and say, this is what life would be like under socialism. <laughs> You're like, no, it's what life is literally like now. It's just a thing that has happened now. And then yeah, maybe it would be better or worse, but you can't pretend that it's something that wise have happened. I'm going to also just say for a second, Rachel Reeves also had no good jokes. Like, I mean, I I was listening out for them thinking, surely someone's... She didn't even have any... I, th- I think she maybe made a decision not to do jokes. And I don't of, think she did any, did she? No, but that was the thing. But she kept... I, my problem was she kept looking like she was about to do a joke <laughs> and then sort of pulled out of it. There was a... Quite towards the end, I thought, oh, here it comes. She's setting up a joke where she says something about... It's a fairy tale marriage between Rishi, with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, but it looked like a fairy tale. But in fact, and I thought, here, here it comes. There's going to be something about a troll or a witch or a gin, <laughs> gingerbread man. or something. There'll be some... And then it, she said, but they don't seem to be doing very well, well together. <laughs> or something. I thought, oh, that's a real shame. It felt like they really she built yeah. something up and it had gone. But, you know. But the uh, Tory benches were loving Jeremy Hunt. I haven't seen scenes like that, honestly. It was just the braying. It was like watching Nigel Lawson back in, you know, back in the day. I think they were sort of imagining, it's like you said about the press are going to make this into sort of a Thatcherite fantasy. They're sort of just imagining what it might have been in their heads. They're pretending to themselves that this is this amazing, huge tax cutting uh, budget that everyone's going to be very excited about. Um, But in the reality, it probably won't be. In the same way they did with, they sort of, they projected all of their um, sort of Thatcherite fantasies onto Liz Truss's budget, and then that very quickly fell apart. So, yeah, who knows? Watch this space. Well, it is an important day in Tory history because it is 33 years to the day as we record since Margaret Thatcher resigned in 1990. Mm. Uh, Interesting anniversary. And they've never got over it. No, never got over it. And it's third of a century now. Third of a century! Wow. Now, let's have a question from one of our Patreon backers in But Your Emails. Don't forget our But Your Emails special on Wednesday the 6th of December. Check our Patreon page for how to send your question. Patreon backer Tommy T asks, We all understand that Labour will have limited bandwidth for change if and when they get in, and that a lot of the most egregious Tory laws may stay on the statute book for want of time to remove them. Which one bit of legislation from the past 13 years would the panel most like Starmer to make a point of revoking? Alex, what do you reckon among the smorgasbord of legislation that we have seen would you like to pluck out? I mean, is this fantasy football? Are we just (laughs) choosing anything? Yeah. Well, then the European Union Withdrawal (laughs) Act 2018, obviously. Um, But but if if we are being more realistic, then I think the Elections Act last year, there's a lot of really nasty stuff in there. The ID stuff, the donation stuff, um, giving loads of powers to the Secretary of State that they don't even have to take through par- Parliament, taking away powers from the Electoral Commission. Did they so, have the? Does that also have the London mayoralty changing? Yeah, from, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. It has. Yeah, it. From it FT, yeah, yeah, changing yeah. So from PR yeah. to uh, first past the post. I mean, th- that is one rancid piece of legislation that I would love to see undone. Yeah, so we are not holding this uh, you to this should you be elected next year. <laughs> uh, but what would you like to see repealed? <laughs> Rightly, so get me in all sorts of trouble. Exactly. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think for me, um, it would definitely be um, the assault on trade unions and the requirement for uh, minimum um, service levels uh, because I think that is an attempt to drive co- coaching horses through the right um, of workers to uh, come together uh, to, you know, go on strike in order to make gains within the labour market. I think it's very dangerous, um, and it's one that I really hope a Labour government uh, would would look to prioritise and look to reverse. And I think they said they will, right? I think That's it's. Why I chose yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Angela Rayner has a lot of plans in the areas of workers' rights, doesn't she? Yeah, this and the previous one actually, because they passed two really nasty union ones. So she's saying they will undo both of them. Matt, how about you? Um, I think probably the Public Order Act um, from earlier this year, because it's it's been used uh, increasingly to sort of create these authoritarian ways of preventing protest. And I think, you know, whether you, whether or not you agree with Just Stop Oil or all those sorts of protesters, I think it's a really dangerous place to be where you are starting to sort of jail people for quite a long time for 
making protests about what is a really important issue. And I think it would also be a signal from Labour that they are going to allow dissent, that they aren't going to just keep these laws and um, and lock up people who disagree with what the government is saying. Because I think there's a there is that sort of fear with someone like Keir Starmer that because he comes from the sort of um, being director of public prosecutions that he's got that kind of perspective of, oh, well, you know, people need to just calm down and, and actually the criminal justice needs to have a bit more power. And I think... For me, that was when that happened and when, when Labour didn't particularly push very hard against it. I think that was, for me, quite a bad sign. So I think that would be, for me, a really positive signal if they decided to have a go at removing that. And the exceptionally long sentences for people who, who take part in protest. Yeah. Yeah, I would also like, it's not terribly important in the grand scheme of things, but exceptionally long sentences for pretty minor acts of civil disobedience, whether it's vandalising a statue or protesting against something, or even during the COVID pandemic, you know, <laughs> having a social gathering, you know, not 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 ideal, but not 10 years in jail. I think that would be a, a trend that would be great to, to reverse. Inheritance tax wasn't cut today, but there was a lot of talk that it might be. And we wanted to try to understand what's going on with this tax. Only 4% of estates pay it, Yet more in common polling says half of us want it cut and only 15% would like it to go up. So what's going on here? Miata, cutting inheritance tax would be a cut for the rich. In the words of Martin Lewis, it would be the least benefit for the most people. But people don't see it that way. Why? Yeah, so it's a really interesting one because, uh, you know, all the analysis suggests that only 4% of estates would benefit. But I think it's a question of aspiration. Um, I think I think it's two things. I think in part people assume that the tax catches more people than it does. But also, even when people say, well, you know, actually, you know, it, it's only on an estate um, over a million pounds. I think people aspire for that. Um, and because of that, there's a sense of, well, one day I might be in that position and, you know, I don't want that to be imposed on me when I want to pass it on to my kids. Um, and that's the thing that makes it really difficult. Um, and it's quite hard uh, tax to kind of break down and explain to people and also quite hard to kind of cut across that sort of sense of aspiration that people want. At the moment, an estate pays 40% on anything over £325,000. And that burden is actually a lot less than it used to be. In 1969, people with estates worth more than three quarters of a million, which was a lot back then, were taxed at 85%. Is it easy to avoid, though, even paying the 40% if you have the right accountant? Well, look, I think a general feature of our tax system is for the very wealthy, there are just a plethora of loopholes and ways in mm -hmm. which you can get around tax. Um, and that applies to inheritance taxes. It does everything else. And, and I think there is a deep unfairness in that. Um, you know, going back to the conversation we were having about tax rises and, you know, people thinking it's fair or not. When you just think there are some people that are getting out of the rules of the game, that's very, very galling. And so, you know, for me, one of the things that I think any government should be doing is just clamping down on that because there are billions that would be raised across the piece. Now, every government talks about it. Very few government actually take action on it. But at a point where taxes are at a high level, so people's tolerance for taxes, you know, is difficult, and also there is just a huge need for investment in our public realm, if ever you were going to get serious about doing it, it's now. Matt, I was surprised to find out that Sweden, Norway and Canada don't have inheritance tax at all. And in the US, the threshold for paying it is more than $12 million. So you have to be pretty well off to be dragged in. But you think that there's a case for taxing inheritances far more highly, don't you? You're quite a radical on this. Uh, yeah, I am, I suppose. I mean, I think I, I have two radical political opinions, which I know will never happen, but sort of I, I just believe and have done for a long time, which is that private schools should be abolished and inheritance tax should be increased a lot. Um, and then particularly in the case of inheritance tax, you give the money back through funding early years education and then perhaps even give every child an amount of cash to invest so that everyone gets sort of a, a nest egg. Um, I think it's just basically, it, it, it's. I think if we could somehow get to a point where people had a bit more of an even start in life, there was some sense of an even 
um, playing field. Um, that would be that would go some way to reducing the sense of structural and generational inequality because that's what happens, I think, with inheritance. Obviously, over many years, it just builds and builds and builds. Uh, and um, and I know that therefore, you know, no government is ever going to say 100% inheritance or even you know. 80%, 70%. But I think you, you could make the case that having a bigger inheritance tax, which is hypothecated to giving money back to, you know, everybody small in small um, in terms of, you know, better education uh, and better um, housing and things. I think that is an argument that can be made that that, that, that would try to reduce structural and generational wealth inequality because that's what it is. It's a wealth tax, really. And I think that's something that, unfortunately, um, politicians in this country just aren't willing to... to to approach. Labour did do a bit something towards that, didn't they, with the child tax fund, mm. um, which I remember, yeah, my, my first child benefited from and my second child to a lesser extent, and yeah. I think does not exist anymore. Is that right, Miata? The child tax fund has been entirely abolished, I assume. Yes, it has. Yes. Assume anything good that was done has gone. <laughs> <laughs> Fair assumption. Uh, Boris Johnson, uh, Matt, wrote a somewhat confusing column last week in the Mail uh, calling for inheritance tax to be cut. What is his justification for this? I think this is one of the most confusing articles I've ever read. It's just confusing amazing, or confused, isn't it? though. Well, both. I think yeah. it did remind me of the famous fact that he wrote two articles about Brexit, the pro anti, <laughs> and it feels like this time he's done the same, but yeah. has then sort of squashed them together. Yeah, it was extraordinary. It was like what? What? Uh, my mind was just blowing with the sheer um, irrationality and the lack of logic that was on display. Because it's really worth. I mean, I would. I very rarely will say this that it's worth reading something in the Daily Mail by Boris Johnson, but it is worth reading it because. <laughs> The first half of it, or even the first two thirds, really, is quite a good explanation, quite a clear, well reasoned, well argued, well evidenced, with lots of good quotes, um, e explanation of why inheritance tax is a good thing. Um, lots of ways in which um, people over the years have explained that inherited wealth is a bad thing and that it doesn't affect people because, uh, you know, living people because they're dead when they pay it and all that kind of stuff. And then right at the end, he just sort of does this weird turn and goes, however, people like me who are sort of baby boomers, we should be able to give more of our money to our children because we've got more money than most generations have had. So we should be able to give it to our children, which... OK, that sort of makes some sense, except, as we've already explained, it only affects a tiny amount of the very richest people anyway. So it doesn't contradict any of the things he said in the first half of his, uh, or it doesn't it doesn't complement any of the things he said in the first half of his article. And all, it, all he's saying is that basically rich people should be allowed to keep a bit more of their money. It's not about reducing structural inequality. It's not about making everybody who's not from the baby boomer generation a bit more, more well off. It's just allowing a few small families a bit more money it makes it's absolutely it's completely mm. incoherent because in his view um, i think that uh, you can trust these young people to spend it well to invest it properly or to buy some property or yeah, something it makes yeah it yeah. Ma made no sense to me at all <laughs> yeah and the new york times weighed in last week with an opinion piece saying that the super rich had got more selfish is that true in the uk as well do you think Again, I found that article very interesting, um, and it reflects something I've been thinking about quite a lot recently. Um, something I've been talking about in my um, show, actually, which I'm touring next year. That the part of the problem at the moment is inequality in the modern world. That's one of the huge, you know, problems. And part of the reason for that is that rich people have got this kind of weird situation now where they've got, they're never going to run out of things to buy. Like in the old days, if you were a very rich person, you'd sort of eventually end up doing something useful for your community because you sort of run out of stuff. You'd end up sort of founding a school or a library or you'd set up a museum, you know, something good for society as long as you don't think about what ended up in those museums. Um, but now there's a sort of market for the super rich. There's always going to be like a bigger yacht or a faster spaceship or like Twitter They'll always have something <laughs> that they can buy that, that you know, and, and then they love interfering <laughs> with politics as well. And, you know, people like Musk and, and others, you know, obviously people who, you know, buy up um, news companies all around the world are essentially using them to advance their own interests. And I love this idea. There's an amazing idea in this article in the New York um, uh, Times where the idea that very rich people in the past hundreds of years ago, were seen as sort of private barns of money, <laughs> which I, I love this idea that rich people were essentially there just in, in an emergency. Everyone understood in society that, yeah, they're going to have to give some of that money to society. Otherwise, we're all dead. You know, we need to when society is threatened, they need to help. 
And COVID has been a brilliant example of the reverse happening, that rich people got significantly richer through COVID. Uh, and as we've already discussed, the people who are going to pay for it are the poorer. I did a bunker on though, which touched on this recently. We talked about the Gilded Age and the you know huge plutocrats who who uh, uh, made so much money during that period in the late nineteenth and earlier twentieth century in in America. And he was saying the man I was interviewing, it just it took a while for the government to work out just how rich these people were and mm-hmm. how they were abusing their market position. But when they did, they started you know, basically bringing in antitrust laws and yeah. cracking down on how much they could buy and how much they could monopolise an industry. And that was how they reined in their wealth. And, you know, it doesn't really feel like that is happening yet no. at all, does well, it? Well, because presumably because the rich people have worked out what's happening, uh, or worked out what happened before and have invested quite heavily in media and things like that so that they they never feel like that political pressure. Alex, is this preoccupation with their inheritance tax? Because, you know, we're talking about it and the papers have been talking. Is, is it a distraction? Does it take our attention away from things like the fiscal drag, which is so important to what was happening in the autumn statement today, where people pay more tax thanks to the fact that tra- tax thresholds have been frozen, but you don't really notice it in the same way mm. because it's not actually a visible rise? I mean, it is a distraction, but not because I think it takes us away from other important economic arguments, but because it takes us away from the more general argument of how to tax wealth and plops us into an area of a, of, of a measure that is both unpopular and ineffective. A, ineffective because of estate planning, because essentially there's only a middle sliver of people that ever pay this stuff, right? Most people never have enough money to leave to come into it. And the people who truly have piles of stuff to leave, they've planned their estate in a way that they won't pay a penny, or it's all hidden in the Cayman Islands. And so I think it takes us, it's a distraction because it takes us away from the real question of how do we tax wealth? And that's the thing that the inheritance regime entrenches and makes worse generation after generation. That's why it's an important argument. And I mean, in many ways, it it is ultimately, we need to decide the philosophical question of do we owe a duty just to ourselves or do we also owe a duty to each other? Because if you answer that question, that takes you into, do I owe a duty only to my progeny or do I owe a duty to the next generation? And depending on how you answer that, arguments about inheritance tax become very, very different. So I think the reason is such a polarizing issue is because it is at the center of capitalism. It really is. It is a core thing that makes us think selfishly rather than societally. It is a core thing that makes us work ourselves into a a grave for much longer than we need to, right? Because after a particular moment, you have enough. You have enough to go and paint watercolors, but you keep working because neoliberalism effectively exploits your instinct to look after your offspring by saying there can never be enough. Work more, put more aside so you can so you can leave a, a, a sec- security for your children. But actually, if you tax wealth properly and you had proper um, uh, you know, public services, that is the ultimate security for your children. So it's a self-defeating thing because it sucks money out of the economy. That's what it does. Is yeah, it, is, I wonder how much of it is a feeling of insecurity that means people feel they must support their, their kids and their grandkids because the welfare state has been eroded to such an extent that they can't trust it anymore. Yeah. And also, it it gets worse and worse, right? Because our birth birth rate is going down. And so, actually, what you have now, instead of having, you know, one um, economic unit uh, splitting the proceeds of their working life between three or four children, you have, in many cases parents who are no longer together with one child. Actually, you're connecting sort of the the wealth of two households into one child. And in many, many cases in my generation, you also have uncles and aunts with no kids. I mean, everything begins to concentrate towards fewer and fewer people because the birth rate is so low. And 
I don't know. I don't know how sustainable that is. I mean, at some point, this stuff always ends with hungry people cutting throats, right? <laughs> and you have to decide whether you want to let it get to that, where the concentration is so extreme that a violent event happens. Or you want to tackle it in a slightly saner and uh, better way before it gets to that. Were you saying something about that? No, I was just saying, just, what you're saying about it just reminded me that the fact that you said that Sweden and Norway don't have it was surprising to me. But then I thought about it and actually those countries are quite heavily taxed and um, their societies in general are much more even and um, much more sort of uh, balanced in terms of what people do for a living doesn't make a massive difference to their status because the tax takes away the money. And so people, it, it does feel a bit more like those societies are based, uh, are, are a more balanced way of doing things and therefore maybe they don't need it. I mean, also sense. there's less to leave, to be honest. My yeah. sister lives in Norway and, you know, when, when children come of age, they're given an apartment and they're given yeah. a car or a loan to get a car and they have like a, a, a chunk of the, the wealth fund, the national wealth fund that mm. owns all the oil and they get dividends from that. And I mean, so... He, I mean, you don't need to leave anything to yeah. anyone, actually. And that's you, perhaps why it's not an issue. If you've got good public services then and you've got good housing and all that sort of stuff, then people don't well, feel like they need yeah, to. Yeah. That's, the, that's the point. Yeah. Ultimately, that's the point. Do you want your children to have a better life than everyone else's children? Or do you want the, gen the next generation to have a better life than your generation? The moment you start to think of it on a, in a collective way, the inheritance thing becomes a nonsense. Mieta, in Britain, we don't tax property much, no matter how much it grows in value. Do you think that we, that will start to change as working people begin to resent the high income tax and the you know, still high national insurance that we, that we pay? So what I'd say is that actually when you compare um, our tax take to other European countries, it's not that high. But for us, it is a 70 year high. Um, and I think that will force a conversation um, with people about, A, you know, what, what are you paying for and what do you expect for that? But B, how do we do this in the fairest way? Um, and I think that's the thing that's missing in the debate. And that principle that everyone sort of you know, trots out, those that have the broader shoulders should bear more. I think most people buy. Um, but, but the reality is that actually, whereas that applies in the context of income, it doesn't necessarily apply in the context of wealth. And I mm -hmm. think there has to be a far bigger set of conversations about, you know, if we want the sorts of public services that everyone wants with an aging population with greater demands on that, what does that mean for the overall take and how do we distribute it? more fairly. Um, and we're a long way from that, but I think that is coming because actually if you're asking people to put in more, they will ask those questions and they will ask those questions of fairness. I mean, 0.7 of the population in this country owns more than a third of the land. I mean, I, I, those are the figures I should say from about 10 years ago when I researched this. I imagine they're even worse now, if anything. But that is not a, you know, real wealth is not infinite. Like the stuff that matters, the, the environment, the land, the food, the water, it, it is not an infinite, uh, infinitely growing pie. And we have to find a fairer way of distributing it. the end of the show. So what are the stories that have gone under the radar this week? Alex? Oh, okay. The representation of the people, brackets, variation of election expenses, expenditure limits and donations, etc. Thresholds. 
order 2023. Um, and, and, and if people are still with us rather than in a coma. Um, so basically, the government has just rushed through a raising of election spending limits without even needing to go to a single vote under those horrible um, uh, provisions we were talking about in the Elections Act. And, um, and so now, uh, four, it's gone to 46 grand instead of 36 grand per candidate um, for a candidate's short campaign. Um, and uh, the threshold for donations no longer being anonymous has risen from 7,500 to 11,000. I've spoken to Naomi Smith, our much missed friend in Best for Britain, and she says that when you combine this with the unincorporated associations donation reporting thresholds and the new overseas voters rules, it just means almost any UK citizen living abroad can register as a, as a voter and start pumping political donations, completely dark money into whatever candidate they want. It, it really is a horrible thing that happened without once being debated or voted on. Why would you do that only six or 12 months before an election? I don't know, it boggles. Indeed. Yeah. Miata, what have uh, we missed? Oh, so I've got a really niche one. Um, so we love a niche <laughs> one. <laughs> love a niche. Uh, so uh, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, uh, launched a new programme to convert private housing into council housing um, with the view of trying to convert about 10,000 additional uh, social homes in London. Now, why this matters is that we know we need to get a far more social homes. The number of social homes are declining against the context of a housing crisis, people not being able to afford something as basic as a roof over their heads. And one of the challenges, how do you build quickly enough? And one of the things that you can do, and actually this is a policy that um, New Economics Foundation has been advocating and pushing for for a while, is how do you convert more of the property, particularly property in the private rented sector, property that isn't necessarily of decent quality, how do you flip that into social homes as a way of massively expanding the number of social homes whilst building? Um, and so this is good news um, in London. And actually, I think off the back of this, I'm hoping there will be a much wider and bigger push to do this across the country because mm. everything we can do to increase the number of social homes, the better. And we've got a long way to go, but this was a bit of good news in a week of bad news. And just quickly, how is he going to do that? Because it sounds like quite a tall order. So two things. I mean, I think a bit of squeeze on landlords that are not good landlords. So expectations about, you know, this is the quality of um, property that we expect, with the, which the Mayor of London does have the power to do. And then he's creating a fund that would essentially allow him to buy back um, some of these properties. Now, what's really interesting is in the housing market at the moment, partly because of what mortgages, there are lots of landlords that it's no longer that lucrative for them. They, they're mm -hmm. wanting to exit the market. And actually, if the public sector and the state can say, right, we'll buy it back, maybe not at the prices you, you, you had them at, but we'll buy it back, bring it into use, into social housing, that's a very, very good thing. And there are lots of organisations, including ours, that think this shouldn't just be a regional programme, but it should be a national programme. That sounds quite encouraging. Mm, Matt, I agree. how about you? Well, you wanted niche. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is just a story that really struck me when I was looking through the papers the other day. Uh, residents of a town in North Queensland in Australia are spending £6 million on helicopters and drones to help tackle colonies of acid-spewing yellow crazy ants. Right. Yep, there's, there's, there's an invasion care. of ants, these tiny little ants, which are like five millimetres long, but they spit acid into your eyes if you're a, an animal. Uh, or and, and don't tell me that they're coming to Britain, are they? Well, they're on the way. They're definitely on the way. And they're, they're called crazy because they make these weird erratic sort of walking style movements. It does give me a slight sort of The Last of Us vibe, it has to be said. Uh, and I looked at that and I, I thought, well, that's fascinating. And it just made me think, look, Australia may have won the Cricket World Cup this week, but at least we don't have acid spewing yellow crazy ants yet. Yet. Yeah, it can't it can't be too long though. Global global warming. Uh, well, on the subject of threats to the environment, I would just like to recommend to everyone to read the new Surfers Against Sewage annual report because it's a really good piece of work. You know, you talk about civil society and it's a boring phrase, but it's actually an example of a of a um, of a group that's done really good work showing the extent of pollution in British rivers and in the sea, and they set out just the extent of 
the uh, water, how much the water companies are releasing and how we don't even know the extent of a lot of it. For in Northern Ireland, for example, they don't even monitor sewage in any way, however inadequately, they don't even monitor sewage outfalls. So we've not no clue at all what's happening in Northern Ireland. It's a great piece of work and I recommend it. And that's the show. Thanks to Matt. Thank you. Alex. My pleasure. And Miata. Thanks for having me. Stay tuned for the extra bit after Demon is a Monster by Corner Shop and the traditional thank you to our army of generous supporters. You too could join them and get the podcast early and without ads, plus lots more. Search Oh God, What Now Patreon to find out how to get yours. We'll see you next time.